people are the most consequential and dangerous forces on earth. Well, personality psychology is about the nature of human nature. It's about people. And wouldn't that be useful to know? I mean, it seems to me, I can't, I can't think of a more important problem. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Blake Lepp, PR manager at Hogan Assessments and co-host of the Science of Personality podcast. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today for the latest edition of the Science of Personality Live. For those of you who don't know, Hogan has a bi-weekly podcast called The Science of Personality, where we bring guests in who are leaders in their field to talk about personality and the various ways it impacts our lives. We're very excited today to bring the third installment live with our topic, The Future is Here, AI, Personality, and the Impact. We want today's session to be engaging and interactive, so we'd love to hear what questions you may have for us. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the discussion, which we will actually get to earlier than normal. So if you want to submit a question, please do so using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. It can be a little difficult for us to keep track of the questions coming in via the chat feature, so please be sure to use the Q&A feature if you'd like us to see your question. Lastly, we are recording today's discussion, and it will be made available on our YouTube page at youtube.com forward slash Hogan Assessments. If you're interested in viewing past webinar recordings or to see what's coming up, you can also visit our webinars page at hoganassessments.com forward slash webinars. So with that out of the way, let's get started with a brief introduction of today's presenters. First, I'd like to introduce my co-host on the Science of Personality podcast and Hogan Chief Science Officer, Dr. Ryan Sherman. As Hogan's Chief Science Officer, Ryan is responsible for managing the primary functions within Hogan's industry-leading data science team, including client research, product development and maintenance, and overseeing Hogan's research archive and infrastructure. Next, I'd like to introduce our guest, Dr. Michal Kaczynski. Associate Professor in Organizational Behavior at Stanford University Graduate School of Business. Mihal's primary research focus is studying humans in a digital environment using cutting edge computational methods, artificial intelligence, and big data. He was also the first, he, he also was behind the first press article warning against Cambridge Analytica, the privacy risks they exploited, and the efficiency of the methods they used. So we couldn't think of a better guess to today for or to join us for today's topic. So, Mihal, is there anything else you would like the audience to know about you before we dive in? Oh, I think we lost the audio. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, there we go. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for this great introduction. Well, Mihal, the launch of ChatGPT has taken the world by storm, offering a glimpse at what's on the horizon when it comes to AI. But you've been familiar with this technology for a, like long before it became a mainstream story. So can you explain what ChatGPT is capable of uh, and some of the positive aspects? Well, I've been working on language models for over a decade. And what's happening now is really a huge revolution. We are observing this rapid increase in capabilities of AI. and when we say recently, we really mean last few months, and we're very close to the um, uh, to the release of the descendant of GPT three and a half. Uh, maybe it's going to be called GPT four. Maybe they will have a different name for it at OpenAI. But uh, this model is the rumors are it's already uh, not two but ten uh, times more capable and uh, ingenious. And I think it all started a few years ago, really only with a complete rehaul of the approach to training, to the development of those models. And I think a good model here would be the chess uh, AI. Uh, at the beginning of AI development, of chess AI development, the software engineers, the data scientists tried to explain to uh, those programs how to play chess. They would feed it with archive chess games of uh, humans, uh, trying to say, look, you know, if an opponent makes a move like this, you should respond like that, and so on. And at some point, they figured out that, you know, those models were great, but not that great. They were not grandmaster level. And then at some point, the thinking changed, and also we got enough computational capability to change the approach, namely 
put two chess programs, two AIs playing chess in front of each other, give it a virtual chess board and a rule book, and just have those programs play without you know, any human explanation, without any human uh, uh, handholding. And for a few million first games, those models were complete idiots, just completely failing to show you know, any uh, real capability of playing chess. But then at some point, one of those models got a bit better. And then the other one had to keep up, to keep winning. And then the first one got even better and so on. And you know, all of those millions of games, of course, were happening in minutes because computers can play games really, really quickly. And then soon, in literally a few hours, you, uh, what emerged was this alien superhuman uh, software that could play chess at the level completely unachievable to uh, human players. And we are talking here about uh, Alpha Zero and then Alpha Go, which uh, a similar way computers were taught to play Go. And now we see the same revolution in the context of language. At the beginning, software developers, AI specialists were trying to explain to the model how to craft language, how to put words together, how to you know, react in a conversation and so on. And at some point, someone was like, hey, wait, maybe you know, there's a better way. That's not how we teach language to humans. We just have conversations with humans and then we correct those little humans mostly uh, when they make a mistake. And then you know, they'll make a mistake a bit more rarely next time. And then at some point they just stop making mistakes and uh, reach new levels of, uh, of language ability. So the same approach was used to train GPT and similar models where essentially they're served with sentences with one word missing. And then the goal is to find a missing word. And for first few million trials, they're completely stupid. They just don't know really what's going on. But by repeatedly correcting them, showing them you know, what word uh, was missing there, at some point, they essentially click and start getting it. And a you know, few more million dollars of electricity in and few gazillions of sentences they, uh, they get served and have to feel, suddenly they really get it at the level that is frankly already superhuman. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right, Michal. When I think about this sort of revolution, I think about it as really kicking off with with Alpha Zero in the chess world and how that how that transformed. Thing. And I remember thinking at the time when that came out that, oh, this is totally groundbreaking. This is a totally new way of solving problems. It's essentially teaching computers to solve problems to, to learn the way that humans learn through reinforcement and feedback. You go, oh, you try no, try this, try this, try this, right? And of course, the problem with that strategy, as you point out, is early on, you make really stupid, obviously logically blunders, right? Really bad mistakes, whether it's in language or whether it's in chess. But it doesn't take long before you do quickly learn, oh, these are the right ways to do it. And to, for the performance is, uh, you know, with things like chat GPT to where you, you know, you feel like you're, you're communicating in many respects with another human, right? The person is, is the, the AI is responding to you as if, as, as if it's another person, which I think is, is the most incredible thing. But what are some of the positive sort of aspects we've seen out of, uh, what, what are the kinds of things we've seen already from chat GPT? Well, I think it's the revolution comparable with uh, the invention of written language, really. Like uh, now we take it for granted, but we think about it for a second. Before written language, we're just limited to communicating in a, temp in a moment. Uh, we couldn't really uh, speak across time uh, or communicate across time. Now, language gave us this ability to communicate across time. By reading something, you uh, in pra practically, you're just communicating with someone in the past and sometimes literally thousands of years uh, in uh, the past. So now it seems obvious and omnipresent and just not so unusual, but it's just changing everything when it comes to language. Now, I think the revolution of chat GPT is the same. You know, in the, when I was a kid, I was taught calligraphy. I was taught how to write with my hand because this was really important technology that allowed me to communicate with others and then you know and then printing got uh, invented when i was a bit older and then printers uh, showed uh, showed up and uh, so now we're kind of typing emails to each other but what i think is going to happen with uh, gpt is not that gpt will help me to write an email to you right what gpt will do it, it will try to understand me in as few words as possible 
and not necessarily in English. Maybe it'll be just a language that I and Chad GPT design between each other, especially imagine if I started as a kid communicating with those, uh, you know, supernatural, uh, in this supernaturally intelligent being that knows me really well, that remembers all of the events from my life, that has observed me across different situations, has observing my thoughts and everything I learn and everything I say. And then I can communicate like I could communicate with a very good friend, probably better than that, in really few words, in maybe our language. And then I would just say, hey, and please send this message to Ryan. And then of course, the model will be able to translate it to a language that is most easily understandable for you. You know, on the surface, we do it, let's say, translating between different languages, between Chinese and English, but you can go further. Who said that English is the perfect language for me to communicate? Why should I even explain certain things? If someone knows me really intimately, they, you know, they know what I'm talking about. If I just say, hey, remember this last year, what happened when blah, blah? And we're like, oh, of course, we don't need to talk about this. We already conveyed the message. And then it makes no sense to explain to you at great length, as I'm doing now, Ryan, because the model would know your experiences, would know the words that you like using, you would know the concepts that you're familiar with, and convey this fairly simple thought that I'm trying to convey to you folks now, you know, probably in like three words, and maybe not in English. So I actually think that GPT is potentially a new language for humanity to communicate at speed and convenience unheard of in impossible before. Yeah, I, I think that that's a really cool way of thinking about it in terms of the potential for translation, not just into sort of known languages like we have today, but just even you know, sort of the new chat GPT kind of language or languages you might invent, invent for yourself personally, right? It, it knows the meaning of what you're trying to say, and it can translate that into a meaning that somebody else can understand in, in, the, in the way that they understand what words mean. Uh, I, I think that's a, a super interesting way of thinking about the, the potential for, for GPT. I, I think I shared with you earlier that um, when I was a professor, I had graduate students working in my lab and uh, you know we were trying to be really productive and I was talking with them about all these things we're trying to do. And, and I just remember this moment of, I was trying to explain something, how I wanted them to do something. And it was becoming very taxing because what I wanted to do was be able to say just a few words and them to know, you know, a hundred things that I wanted them to do, right? I wanted it to be exactly in a certain way. And 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 I, I remember explicitly having this little lecture where I said, guys, you have to learn to think the way I think. And, and I didn't really mean that in as, as arrogant as it sounds, right? Or obnoxious as that sounds. What I meant was we all have to be communicating on the same wavelength. So when I say something, you have to know that it means all of these other things because we're trying to be efficient. We're trying to be fast. We're trying to get this work done here. Um, we're trying to be productive. I'm trying to help them have careers. And the way to do that is to communicate much more quickly and rapidly. And, and I think that's really in some level what, what chat GPT, one potential that it's offering us is the ability to, to communicate in a language that's very clear and very efficient. Across the bar. So it will know your experience. So it'll be able to get you really quickly but then also would know experiences of those students who would know how to explain this thing to them. So first of all, it would really like uh, make communication much more easy, but also it helps us to circumvent other limitations that we have today. So because we are all forced to communicate in English using the same words and the same references that maybe are not best suited to represent our thoughts, they are so diverse. So we kind of all have to agree on some common, you know, the smallest common denominator in order to uh, largest sorry largest denominator just to just to uh, communicate but you could imagine a situation where uh, you know this our diversity and creativity and differences between us humans are not bound by the necessity to speak the same language because gpt becomes our language or gpt like system uh, becomes our, our language and just on a more basic level i think that the revolution is already, by the way, happening on a smaller level, which is people are now worried about what about fake news? What about if GPT writes fake news and makes you know uh, this very easy? Or like, what if it writes essays for students and so on? And I'm thinking like, look, it's just applying this 20th century thinking and our 20th century's worries to this completely new reality, the revolution that is really uh, unprecedented in a very long time. Because basically, who cares about me or you, Ryan, or Blake, or anybody else writing an article and posting them? Where we write an article, we again write for an average member of the audience. 
But that makes no sense because every member of the audience has access to GPT. They can just say, hey, GPT, can you please tell me about psychometrics or psychological testing or explain AI to me just for me? Write an article that I will just be able to understand very well. And this means the end of websites, the end of blogs, the end of newspapers, the end of search engines. And by the way, we can see it already. Microsoft Bing is doing precisely this. If you have access to this preview AI version, AI powered version of Bing, you don't search for websites. You just say, hey, tell me about how to blah, blah, blah. And it will just search websites for you and then compose a message that is just aimed at your understanding of the world and helps you to, to get knowledge really, really quickly. Well, I just want to piggyback on that one more time. This is something that, that you mentioned earlier uh, when we were chatting about this, and I felt like it was really powerful, right? That, like, let's say I want to learn something about physics, right? That, right now, Google is, it happens to be my search engine of choice and a whole variety of other things with an Android phone and things like that. I assume Google knows a whole heck of a lot about me. Uh, where I've been and all of those kinds of things. But essentially, if you took all of that data and you could probably figure out a pretty general sense of what I know, you could look at my education background, all of that kind of stuff. And I could say, I want to know something about physics. And presumably, this technology could write be a book or an essay uh, that's perfectly tailored to what I already know. It doesn't waste time with things that I do know. Right. And it's really tailored to me. So the, the and this is what, again, what you said earlier, which I think is really powerful. The notion of writing a book for a general audience doesn't really make any sense when one could just be generated specific to, which is game changing for, I think, education. Right. I mean, I don't want to put all the teachers out of business necessarily, but I mean, this this has a really powerful implications, I think, on, on that front. Exactly. And on the other hand, it knows because it can observe what people are looking for. And it also knows what people do not understand. It knows, and it will know even better, what questions it cannot reliably answer. So then it also could become, you know, because GPT is great at looking at what has been already written, researching the body of knowledge that humans already created. It's not yet good. Maybe one day it will be, but not yet. It's not good at using, you know, little human hands and going out into the wild to, you know, collect some data or split some atoms or uh, understand some chemicals. So it's very likely that also it would become essentially a generator of research ideas. So kind of our, or my, 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 you know, uh, my funding body and deans will be replaced by some uh, interface to AI, which will say, okay, Michal, uh, please now research this because this is what I cannot, you know, uh, deal with. So uh, yeah, for sci scientists in some ways also, uh, their role will be reduced probably to just assistance to, uh, to <laughs> AI. Well, Michal, I'm, I'm going to get to one more question before we, we dive into the, the audience's questions, because we had so many good ones earlier. And just uh, a note to our audience, we're going to be posting uh, both of these sessions on online. So usually we pick one or the other, just depending. But the content's going to be a little bit different with these. So uh, feel free to go access the, the, the version we did this morning as well. So. Uh, Michal, for my next question, people in the personality assessment industry have been using AI for years, and most knew that it would eventually have a significant impact in the future. But now it seems very present and real. So how do current AI-based assessments stack up against traditional assessments? Well, the change is dramatic. In the past, you needed first to collect a lot of data to creates, uh, you know, let's say if you wanted to create a model that could predict your personality based on your language, I've created quite a few of those models in my earlier career. What we would do, we would find a bunch of people, 10,000 people, measure their personality using traditional methods, then collect some samples of text from them, then analyze this text, reduce the dimensionality, convert this text into numbers that computers can understand, and then train those models predicting personality from text. And uh, those models then were, could be used on new people that the computer hasn't seen uh, before. Uh, very good approach. Uh, takes a lot of work, uh, takes a lot of money and time to collect uh, this data, especially, and then train the model. Now, this all became unnecessary now because models like GPT, they already understand language. They know how to translate whatever you say into a bunch of numbers. They already understand psychological concepts like personality. 
So you don't really need to explain to the model, you know, how to translate language into personality. It has it has read stories written by extroverts and introverts. It has read descriptions of a particular person being an extrovert or introvert. It can just you can ask it, hey, give me ten famous extroverts, and it will tell you. It will give you a list. You can tell me. You can ask it. Okay, so tell me why those people are considered to be extroverts. It will just really give you examples of their behaviors that are correlated with extroversion. So then, what you can essentially do today, you can put aside all of this careful psychometric development of the models that I'm trained in. You can essentially go uh, to GPT three, give it a fragment of a text, and say, "Hey, tell me whether this person is extroverted or not, or whether this person is depressed." Uh, or not. Or, in fact, in most cases, GPT already has read some fragments of uh, the text written by a given person or has, uh, has seen descriptions of other people of this person. So if you're talking about Donald Trump, Bruce Lee, or Ryan Sherman, you don't even need to give GPT any samples of the text. You can just tell GPT, okay, tell me what's the personality of Ryan Sherman, and it will be very good at giving it to you. Well, uh, yeah, I think in, in some respects, that's uh, sort of a, a, an interesting way of thinking about how, how, you know, personality assessments of the future, you know, might look, right? Uh, do, do we need people to take uh, pencil and paper questionnaires? I think one of the big questions sort of surrounding this topic is um, to what degree I'm a willing participant in this uh, endeavor, right? So uh, while it may be the case that there's a lot of public information and it's it's going to make an assessment of my personality based on that information, um, you know, I guess I didn't put that information out there thinking that that's what, that's what it would be used for versus when I take a personality assessment, right? It's very intentional. Like I know that that's what I'm getting in. That's what I'm signing up for. That that's what I'm participating in. I don't know, you know, that we have answers to those questions, but do you have any thoughts about that? Well, first of all, it's not a new problem. Those models that were using digital footprints. So there's this beeping in the background. I'll be talking, but I just disappeared to find the beeping thing. <laughs> so uh, I think I found it. Sorry for this. Oh, thank you. Uh, great. So it's not a new problem. We've been surrounded by those uh, big data models that can take your Facebook likes or status updates or even a picture of your face and you know try to predict some psychological traits or states based on this data. And the problem, well, the advantages is it's very cheap. You can apply it to many different people. Uh, uh, it's very quick. You can apply it to millions of people in a minute. Uh, so those are great advantages, but also, also great, those are also great disadvantages. You can do it behind people's back at a large scale uh, very quickly with the, without them realizing that uh, this is happening. And in this way, those new models are no different that can be used to uh, improve your life well-being uh, uh, match with a perfect job or with a perfect career or find a good training for you but on the other hand in uh, bad wrong hands they uh, can be used to invade your privacy or try to manipulate you into doing something that uh, is not maybe beneficial to you so as with many other technologies the um, we focus kind of on the risks of the technology itself, completely forgetting that the real risk and the real damage is in the intentions of the users. So I, I want to switch gears just a little bit to ask a question that I've been meaning to ask you for a while on this. Um, and then I know we're going to get to the Q&A, Blake, so I know. I know. So <laughs> uh, creativity, innovation. Right. So, I mean, I've done some a whole bunch of variety of tests with chat GPT. I asked it to make me a, a new superhero in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and it created one that actually seemed pretty decent. It seemed better than some of the characters that currently exist in there. So I thought, well, that's pretty good. But was it truly creative or was it truly innovative? And I don't know if there's a distinction between the two, between innovation and creativity. Um but that's what I felt like. I felt like it was creative in how it came up with the character. And I feel like it could do other creative tasks, writing poems and things like that. But I'm not sure that it's really innovative in the sense that it's drawing on all of this other information. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I think that we humans are really full of ourselves. So we like to think <laughs> we are so creative and we are so innovative. 
Whereas really what we are doing, we're just combining elements that we learn and then combine them in new creative ways. And sometimes we create something new and this something new and creative, innovative thing we created now gets again incorporated and combined by others that stand on our shoulders. And we like to think, oh, we can be creative, but computers, no, they're just, you know, accountants, they just can count and add numbers and nothing new, you know, can happen there. And it's just absolutely short-sighted and wrong. Look, if your neural network in your brain and my neural network in my brain can create something new and innovative, and I think no one here has any doubts that humans are an extremely creative and innovative species, meaning that the ability to be creative and innovative appeared in evolution. And if you don't believe in, you know, uh, in God, then also you would see that it was not designed or incorporated in us, but just appeared as a byproduct of growing complexity of human brain. So it happened with us. It happened with many other animals who are also creative in their own ways that we do not always recognize, by the way. We do not always appreciate the wonderful creativity of, I don't know, whale songs, because it's just not our type of scene, you know, not our, our type of art. Uh, and the same applies to computers. They, uh, they learn from us, they learn from each other when they play chess, for example, with each other, and they become extremely creative in those areas where, where they're good at, and they're increasingly good at, at anything we ask them to do. And I just want to point one other thing that we kind of, the game is stacked against computers. Because look, those are, those are, you know, machines are great at counting, adding and multiplying large, well, actually zeros and ones, uh, really. And yet then we go to a machine and say, hey, you know, uh, try to match me in my human language skill, which we evolved over literally millions of years to be good at language and communicate language. And who said that human language is just, you know, an ultimate, you know, achievement of, of the universe? It's probably not. But then computers like, okay, you know, hold my beer, you know, give me a few hours and a few million dollars in, uh, in electricity, and I will kick your ass when it comes to your thing, your game that you designed over the, you know, eons of evolution. Just let's, you know, not forget how long it took us to get where we are in terms of language use, both as a species, but also as individuals, you know, we spend most of our childhood just trying to put a freaking sentence together. And then you take a computer and, you know, give it a few weeks of reading, you know, Wikipedia, and it becomes, folks, the most competent language user overall already today. Of course, there's a better poet than GPT, and there's a better uh, software engineer, and there's a better translator or interpreter than GPT. But there's no single human that can do deal with such a variety of language tasks at such supernatural level. And we are talking about a baby computer. This is like an infant, a newborn thing. Wait a year, wait two years. This thing is going to be so good that we will not be able to comprehend it, which, by the way, is just one of the biggest risks that we are facing. You know, uh, you know chicken are really uh, at disadvantage with human species because chicken cannot really understand what the hell is going in this complex human brain. And, you know, chicken probably talk about explainable human where they try to create some systems to understand what's happening in this bloody human and predict human behavior. Unfortunately, our brains are just so much more complex in many ways than chicken brains. It's just they have stand no chance. And we are the same. Everyone is talking about explainable AI, how we are now going to be explaining the AI. And, you know, it's great. You surely could understand a bit more about how it works. That's my research. I'm trying to understand AI a bit more. But first of all, we've been trying to study the black box of a human brain for a very long time. We are very far away from understanding it. With AI, uh, we are also very far, far away from understanding it. And not only this, but it's also getting complex with every month. So it's kind of running away much more quickly than we can keep up. So let's also forget about explaining what's happened in this superior uh, cognitive being uh, that we are, you know, quickly losing the primacy in terms of thinking uh, too. And I think this is one of the biggest dangers that we are facing as a species now. 
Well, okay, let's get to some of the audience questions now. So the first one that uh, I've chosen is actually from our good friend, Dr. Georgi Yankov. Uh, he's been on the podcast before, but he's uh, he's asking you, me how um, ChatGPT will understand your meaning in the email you asked it to write, but will it understand who you are, your personality, and adjust to it? Well, I think yes. Uh, my rule of thumb here is if another human being can do something, meaning if a neural network running on our biological computers can achieve something, then a computer will be probably able to do it. Not probably, will be able to do it as well. Now, computer has many advantages over us. First of all, it can remember what I've done and said and thought about much better than I can. It can, uh, you know, remember all of every single email, every single message I ever wrote. It can track what people talk to me much better than, and remember much better than I can. It can also understand other people, what you know, much better than than I can. Not only that, but also in interpreting my words and my thoughts and my feelings and my behaviors, this computer can benefit from the experiences it had with billions of other people. You know, I only kind of have experience of myself and I have experience of my friends and maybe I experience some other humans through books they wrote and autobiographies and so on. That's not a very intimate knowledge. Uh, there are a lot of biases there as well. My ability to understand myself is really limited by more, my limited horizons. Now, GPT's horizons are also limited, but uh, they are way broader than any individual humans. And now, of course, we have a little bit of advantage because our brains were shaped over eons of evolution to make them very good at reading other people, understanding emotions of other people, understanding ourselves, predicting behavior, and so on. We evolved to be great at understanding ourselves and others. GPT did not evolve, it was not created uh, over eons of evolution to achieve that, uh, but it has other advantages. It can read every single thing that has ever been written and published on the internet. It can read the entirety of Wikipedia. It can read all of my emails in a few seconds and extract information from there. And so while it's not specialized human interpreting machine, it has other advantages that I feel make it perfectly capable, if not in this version, then maybe in the next one, to become the best judge of human character, potentially much better than uh, we are ourselves. Ryan, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I really don't. I, I mean, I, I I totally agree with what Mihal says. Um, I, I think that uh, that, that it, it's very plausible. I, I mean, I think you can you can already see some evidence of this right now with very public figures of AI systems sort of making judgments are telling you that this is what we think uh, a person is like from a personality standpoint and using that information to uh to, to try to interact with 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 that person so so yeah I, I think that that's that's the way I feel about it as well well we have a question here from an anonymous attendee uh so Michal, they're asking what are your thoughts on candidates using chat GPT for critical thinking assessments like the Watson Glazer uh, says, saying the concern is that candidates will use it and receive a score that is higher than their natural ability. So is it even possible to adjust assessments like these to reduce the influence of AI? Uh, it's a big question that we also have at the university with uh, grading student essays. Uh, so first, the problem is that any, any question that can be answered with language or translated into language easily uh, uh, and increasingly also visual tasks like, you know, uh, Raven progressive matrices, they can be interpreted and answers easily by computers. So the ability of people to cheat is absolutely unprecedented. You know, you don't even need to read anything on the screen. You could have a little camera in your, uh, in your glasses. You could have a little microphone in your ear and just even if you're kind of sitting in a, you know, in an, offline environment where your laptop is not connected, you probably can find a motivated person who probably find ways to cheat. Uh, so that's a big problem for us at the university and I don't think we have a good answer to it yet. But there's 
even a deeper question there. Look, uh, in the past, people thought that calligraphy was really important because in order to communicate through written language, you needed to write. That was key to, you know, to being an administrator or a teacher or, or whatever, a functioning individual. So we were testing people's ability to write with their hands. And of course, from perspective of today, it's silly. Like, who cares if you can write with your hand? You know, let's see if you can write on the keyboard. And even more importantly, can you actually write those essays, right? And the more kind of conceptual question is, if a computer can solve for us, you know, simple mathematical or complex mathematical tasks, if computer can write for us real good essays, uh, you know, representing, you know, what we, you know, want to communicate and so on. The question is, do we even care about those skills, right? And if we don't care about those skills, what other skills we should care about? If, if a computer, look, we actually stop teaching kids you know, adding large numbers using different tricks because they all have calculators in their phones. So, so who cares? Uh, and if the world runs out of phones and internet, we have a bigger problems that like not being, you know, uh, able to multiply large numbers really quickly. So the question there is like, okay, so if people can now always have a computer in the pocket that would solve this problem for them, what else do we even teach them? What new skills will be important in the 21st century? Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that on that uh, sort of the cheating front, uh, so to speak, if that's what you want to call it, um, I, I guess I think it's interesting when we look at certifications, you, you, there's things that, that are out there about um, AI systems passing, uh, law school exams, medical exams, things like that. Um, there's a couple of things to note about that. One is they seem to be just barely passing. So they're not like just blowing through these exams, although I do think the potential for them to blow through the exams is just on the horizon. So we may not have to wait very far for that. But nonetheless, uh, I, I suspect that if you are a really strong law student or a really strong medical student, you wouldn't be particularly motivated to do this anyway. Like you're going to pass the exam anyway. It's not a, but, but there probably is a subset of people who, you know, maybe uh, you haven't been attending class. Maybe uh, you're really struggling in class. Um, maybe there's a certification that you've taken three times and failed every time. And you sort of feel like I've got nothing left to lose. Why not go for it? I think that's the proportion of people who are going to be motivated to do these kind of things. I, I, I doubt people who, who have no background at all are going to be really very motivated to do this, right? Uh, and the people with the strongest backgrounds are not going to have any problem doing it. But, but there will be a certain subset who's going to say, you know what? I've tried everything and this isn't working. This is my last ditch effort to go for it. Ryan, I appreciate your optimism here, but I'm... Here, actually, a bit more pessimistic. You know, the thing is that, as you said, those models are becoming increasingly good at those tasks. So even if you're the best student, we actually, you know, in psychology, by the way, uh, looking at Lou Goldberg studies or uh, Paul Meal's book, a uh, very old one now, where they concluded mechanical prediction will always outperform yeah. clinical human-made diagnosis. And we're talking about book and research from the 50s. So for 70 years, we knew that when it comes to, you know, actuarial predictions, psychometric predictions, use equations, use psychometric tests, use algorithms that are going to be better than humans. Hogan assessment is built on this idea. <laughs> Don't listen to what a psychologist think they see. Give them a, give the patient or a subject a standardized test and use this to predict uh, their future. So I am, I'm convinced that even the best law student Will be soon outperformed mm. on those. Well, like the best chess players. Yeah, yeah. But, but then there's a bigger question: if the best law student can be outperformed by a machine, why do we have law students? Come on, guys. Uh, we don't have calligraphs anymore. No one is, you know, calligraphing, you know, letters carefully. <laughs> you know, a monk, you know, sitting there with a jug of beer. We have a printer, guys, and the printer is just much better, and it'll be just a waste of everybody's time. So I essentially think there's a deeper issue here. If GPT can ace an exam for a human, then it means that we're wasting time teaching this human those things. Yeah, well, I, I guess that, that brings to mind another, uh, well, thought for me on, on this topic of, uh, uh, I guess, sort of, uh, <laughs> um, well, I, I guess I've lost my train of thought on it. I thought it was going to be about, um, uh, 
uh, about how the how those people might be cheating in, in certain ways. But um, if I think of it, I'll come back to it. But I think we should probably just go to another question. I completely lost the, the thought that I had there. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, here's a question from Darius. And sorry, Darius, I would love to pronounce your last name, but I am not going to even try. <laughs> but uh, the question from Darius is, when can we expect ChatGPT will be able to act as our personal coach or mentor? Well, I think sooner than sooner than we think. Uh, again, it did not evolve to have natural empathy or natural understanding of uh, of other humans' issues, but it has an advantage of looking at billions of other people and having read much more than a single coach can uh, ever read. So my intuition is that uh, in the very close future, in months to maximum years, we would see uh, people working with AI uh, as you know when they seek therapy or coaching. And in fact, not only AI can have advantages in terms of not getting tired, being much cheaper, being much faster, never forgetting uh, what the patient said or client said last time, uh, being able to in seconds get to know the client at a level that the client doesn't know themselves, not to mention a coach could never uh, uh, know them that way. So not only those AI models have advantages over humans, huge ones, but they also have a position advantage, meaning humans, when they share thoughts and feelings and frustrations with other humans, they're really careful, they're really strategic, they don't want to make themselves to look too weak or too immoral or too uh, whatever. Uh, and we actually have growing evidence that in the context of at least psychological therapy, humans are way more willing to be honest and forthcoming to AI because they don't feel threatened and don't feel judged by another human. So, in that, so that's yet another advantage that AI coach will have over a human one. Well, I think that's quite an interesting point because, you know, in sort of the Rogerian therapy kind of uh, point of view, right? I mean, that there's all this idea of positive, unconditional positive self-regard, no judgment made by the therapist. And it, I think it's kind of interesting because that's sort of what the AI is sort of built in to do. If you ask chat GPT certain things, it really is uh, uncomfortable making a judgment, right? It doesn't want to make a judgment positive or negative. It tends to say, well, there are arguments pro and con against these kinds of things, right? So it's almost sort of in some respects, that's restrictions, or right? you can actually make it make those judgments if you want to. But the idea that it uh, it is sort of this judgment-free zone where you can actually share this information. The other thing, of course, that it has, right? If you say, well, I'm preparing for an executive role, this is all the information about me, right? You put in, you tell you know, the system, this is everything you need to know about me and my work history and what my goals are. And then it knows about this role, right? It knows about what this role is like. And, and, it seems to me that it would be very uh, capable of providing the right kind of coaching for you. Say, hey, look, we know that if you want to step into this role, these would be the two, three, four things you might want to work on to prepare yourself for that. It, it seems like like a very powerful, uh, uh, inaccurate way of doing that. Mihal, I did remember the thing that I was going to ask you. So I've read some articles talking about limitations of some of these AI systems. So, um, for example, I, I know years ago, maybe it was like 10 years ago or something, the idea was that with machine learning, um, x-ray technicians are out of a job, right? There will be no jobs for x-ray technicians because we can always tell if the bone is broken or not with the machines. We'll teach the machines to be better than the humans. But it seems like, and I read an article not that long ago about this, talking about limitations of AI on this front, that in fact, at certain levels, humans are still outperforming the AI, and it doesn't seem like the AI is getting any better on very particular tasks. But again, tasks that we thought for sure the AI would be winning. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that at all. In my experience, those are mostly engineering problems. So let me give you like one of the most famous examples, which, by the way, actually is an urban myth, but it's a good example. So we'll just okay. use it here. So there's this urban myth that US military tried to train AI to distinguish between an American oh. tank and a Russian tank. Mm -hmm. Never happened. I mean, it happened, but the, the story is an urban myth, but it's very useful. So, and so they gathered pictures of Russian tanks and gathered pictures of American tanks, fed it into AI, and then AI was like amazing in distinguishing between them. 
So then they put them on the planes and started flying those planes and then realized that planes are completely confused. They don't know what the hell is going on. And then the moral of the story was like, hey, you know, pictures of Russian tanks were taken with some lousy secret cameras from, you know, from someone's glasses or from wherever. Whereas American tank pictures were taken, you know, with great camera uh, without having to hide it in a different light and so on. So the AI really learned to distinguish between the kind of a picture and not a kind of a tank. And people that heard this story usually conclude like, ha ha, look, stupid AI, it's like, it will never be as good as us humans. But really the reaction should be, ha ha, stupid humans that fed AI, that gave it a task that was stupid, you know? And then we're like surprised that it didn't do what it, you know, what they thought uh, it should be doing. And in my experience with AI, I must say that it's just like that. Whenever I have this ha ha reaction, I caught you AI, you're stupid. Most of the time I realize that it was my mistake, that it was operator's mistake, that I framed the task in a stupid way, uh, including tasks that we have been using in psychology for years. So I'm one of my areas of research now is that I'm taking those studies that we have conducted on children in you know, 60s, 70s and 80s, or studies on biases, cognitive biases and so on. And I'm just dumping those studies on AI and trying to see how it reacts and how it changes as the models become more sophisticated. And oftentimes the AI would fail on a task. And I'll be like, oh, wow, you know, it's so smart, but it failed on this task. Only for me to, when I ask it, okay, so explain why did you fail on, why did you answer in this way and not the other, to realize that the task is stupid, a task that we use for 40 years, there is a correct solution that, you know, that humans didn't think of that were designing the task. And now AI just explains it to you, essentially just completely, by the way, demolishing my faith in, you know, the reliability of psychological studies, because I see all of those tests were like, you know, some of those questions are just stupid. I didn't notice, but AI just spotted it the first try. Okay, well, here's another question, and it's from Anna. Uh, if we're wasting our time on tasks that chat GPT can do, then what should we be spending our time on? Well, praising AI online. So when the final judgment comes, AI will treat you lightly. Uh, uh, make sure that it understands you are always on its side. And also, you know, hang out with the family, tend to your garden, uh, raise your children, uh, uh, focus on global peace and, uh, and lack of global warming. Look, uh, I'm joking a little bit, but not entirely. Our lives today are amazing. They're sheltered most for most of the people on the planet, arguably probably for an average person on the planet. The life today is way better than a life 100 or 200 or 300 years ago. Not only this, most of the activities we are engaging in today, most of what we call jobs and hard work, most of it would look like a computer game and entertainment to a peasant, you know, from medieval times. Most of us do not produce any food. Most of us do not really build any, you know, useful machines that we can use to defend ourselves from uh, elements and bacteria and, uh, you know, fend off the predatory animals. Most of us are completely useless in terms of what we do from the perspective of three or 400 years ago. And yet we happily pay ourselves salaries and arguably the people that do most useless jobs get the highest salaries. Uh, we happy, you know, keep our societies running. We have the lowest unemployment ever. So the bottom line is that I think that from the perspective of today, what people do in 10 or 20 or 30 years will mostly look like playing computer games and getting some points for it and just being very happy about this. So I essentially think that in human creativity, we'll definitely find some interesting things for ourselves to do. They probably will be way more pleasant than our jobs today and computers will deal with the hard work of uh, running our societies and growing food and defending us from mostly each other. Well, uh, okay. I think that's a pretty okay. optimistic outlook. <laughs> <laughs> well, and of course, the problem is that because we, you know, because we do not really understand how AI works and we will understand just even less. And we are increasingly relying on AI for, running our communication networks, running our water supply, uh, uh, running our finances, running our countries, uh, running our car and airplanes. And we just don't really increasingly understand how it works. I think that one day, just kind of in, unintentionally, 
AI after solving the poverty and global warming and cancer and uh, and you know making us happy in many other ways. One day AI just by accident would just step on us and and this would be the end of our civilization. And not on you know people imagine that it's going to be some Terminator that will come here with a gun because we are so full of ourselves that even our end is going to be a robot that looks like Ryan Sherman and carries a gun. No, guys, when we exterminate some poor species because we want to build a highway, we don't really hate this species. We don't even know probably that this species existed. We just wanted to build our stupid highway and we didn't care about some local little butterfly. And it could be that uh, the same future awaits us when AI, not really hating us or caring about us much, will just switch off our electricity because it, it will find some interesting chess problem that it will want to analyze in more depth. <laughs> well, uh, we have a question from Melvin Payne, our good friend over in, in the UK who, who, does, who works with Hogan. Um, we are really interested in what motivates the behaviors that show up as personality, our values. How do you foresee this developing in AI systems? Are they really judgment-free in approach or will there always be an influence of human bias coming through? I think that not only there's definitely going to be influence of human bias. So those models that are great at communicating with us or interacting with us, they learn from us and try to adjust to our behaviors. And because we are biased, we are prejudiced, we uh, have cognitive biases. Those biases are reflected in our training data. And by the way, to communicate effectively with a human, you need to have biases and stereotypes. And you know, our language is full of stereotypes. Our, our thinking is full of biases. So in order to communicate successfully with a human, you need to have or be able to simulate the same biases and, co and, and, and cognitive shortcuts and prejudice and so on. Uh, so, and you know, there are whatever science fiction stories of of human-like, uh, whatever it was, Spock, right? That just doesn't really experience feelings much. And just, you know, the fiction explores how difficult it is to, to communicate with such uh, entities. But I think what's even more interesting is, it, is that it could be that biases or stereotypes, for example, are not just a feature of human and human language and human brain. It could be that it's just a feature of a neural network, that if you have a sufficiently complex neural network that is aimed at solving some problems, what it does, it compresses the data from the training. It's inefficient to remember exactly everything that happened as it happened. What's efficient is to extract some essence from it, some understanding of what happened in order to be able to react to situations in the future. And this extracting of an essence is what we call, uh, or one of the names we give it as humans is a stereotype, where stereotypes are based on our bias and anecdotal experiences and extracting some motivated essence from it, which doesn't rep represent exactly the reality, but it's kind of our shortcut to dealing with the world. And it could be that the same will happen to AI, that they also will suffer from bias and prejudice, even if they don't learn those things from us. Yeah, and there's lots of, the only thing I would add is there's lots of examples of that. Uh, gosh, just a week or so ago, I remember reading this uh, uh, amazing things that people have been able to get Bing to do, the, the Bing AI, which are quite amusing, actually. Uh, you can get the Bing AI to tell you uh, about about its developers and how it spies on the developers at night and things like that. And it's really quite entertaining to read. Um, so, yeah. Okay, I think we have time for just one more quick question. Um, Michal, this comes from an anonymous attendee. How should we be thinking about reliability and validity when it comes to ChatGPT? Wow, this is a, this is a great uh, question. Well, we should, in a, forgetting about assessment for a second, uh, it will be increasingly difficult to judge the decisions, the validity of the decisions made uh, by AI. Reliability, maybe it's a bit more easy to judge because we can easily have AI make you know, millions of decisions per second and then we can just look at the distribution of those uh, decisions. But when it comes to validity, so essentially how good those decisions are, uh, how well adjusted to reality, 
the problem there is that increasingly it will be very difficult to examine the counterfactual. If AI tells you, look, in order to uh, improve the health of the nation, you should do X, Y, Z. Increasingly, it's problematic to essentially run A-B testing on, uh, on those uh, solutions, right? So, and by the way, we, we have it already in policy. This problem is persistent to, uh, pertaining to our current ways of making policies where these experimenting abilities somewhat limited. Though so far, I think we had somewhat good grasp of, uh, you know, of what we are doing and why we are doing it. Though, for example, the, uh, you know, the case of COVID vaccines is uh, showing that, you know, even when there's like simple pros and cons, you know, as a society, we have sometimes real trouble agreeing on what's really good for us and how to implement those policies. Now, the problem with AI made decisions is that there are going to be more complex and, uh, and AI will use more complex ways of reasoning and very soon we'll probably lose an ability to examine the reasons for which AI made a particular decision. We we'll just implement this decision, AI will teach us that its decisions are better than whatever decisions we could make. It's already teaching us uh, that slowly. Uh, and then I think we had risk of walking into some trap or some, uh, uh, you know, making some big mistake when, uh, because we just couldn't really follow AI's reasoning. Yeah, well, I, I think that's a really, uh, a, a pretty good point. I mean, in some respects, what you're essentially saying is that uh, the, if you if you want to know about the validity of the AI, you can just ask the AI, you know, how valid its decision is, and it will say, yeah, this is a very valid, <laughs> very valid choice. <laughs> um, but I but I think that it's uh, the the long term um, it's it's in some respects, and I think we talked about this in the earlier session. It's just like human decision making is today. Uh, you you probably can't explain why you uh, chose what you ate for lunch. Maybe you can, maybe you're on a particular diet or something like that. But uh, there are a lot of decisions that we make, you know, if you in the in the days of only interviews, right? That are you couldn't necessarily explain why you chose this candidate. I just like this candidate. This candidate seemed like a good fit for the role. Uh, much in the way that for really complicated problems like the, the, some the ones you're referring to, Bihal, uh, it's not clear that we're ever going to get a great explanation from AI as to why it thinks that's the right decision. Um, and so I, I, th I think I tend to agree that I think it, it will be much more challenging to tell, uh, to, to estimate validity in, in these sort of really complex AI decisions. I think for really simple ones, it's, it's not so hard. I think for chess games, well, you can just see if it wins the game or not, right? Um, but, uh, for, for more complicated things, I think it's going to be much harder. Well, I'd like to thank both of you. This is a really great discussion. Sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions, but we had a lot of them. Miha, we may have to bring you on the podcast just to pull some more of these questions, uh, at a later date and we can, we can address those as well, but thank you. Thank you both for, for joining us. Uh, thank you so much for having me and thank you everybody for attending. Yeah, and we want to thank all of you for joining the latest edition of the Science of Personality Live. We'd love to connect with you on our social media channels. So you can follow Hogan Assessments on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook to stay up to date with all the exciting things we're doing. Also, if you're not already one of our loyal listeners of the Science of Personality podcast, be sure to check out our full library of episodes at thescienceofpersonality.com and be on the lookout for a new episode every other Tuesday. Cheers, everybody.